Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's live astronomy program. Uh, we're helping you see outer space without leaving your place. As always, uh, my name is Justin, one of the astronomers at the Science Museum of Virginia. Happy to help bring the dome into your home. And of course, we wouldn't be able to do this without our generous sponsor, Allianz Partners. Always happy to have them on board. Now, if you have watched some of our previous shows, welcome back. If you're joining us for the first time, glad to have you on board as well. Uh, you are joining in the midst of an ongoing series. Uh, uh, we're on a journey to get out to the edge of the universe, uh, but uh, we aren't quite there yet. We're taking small steps every week. Uh, so if you want to catch up on the journey so far, uh, check our uh, video archive here on Facebook. All the previous shows are, are saved there. And then tune in again next week where we'll have another show for you. As always, during the show, we're going to be using the same software that powers the planetarium at the Science Museum. It's software called Digistar 6, and it can do some pretty cool stuff. So uh, if you're able to, I recommend uh, expanding the video to, to full screen, watching it on a nice big monitor if you have one. I'm going to be doing the same thing. So every once in a while, you may see me look off to the side. Uh, that's just me looking at uh, a second larger screen, uh, trying to enjoy the show right along with you. Uh, today, Today's show has, uh, has quite a lot of ground to cover. I've got some current events for you, uh, threw in an anniversary, a couple of your questions. Uh, and if you have more questions that uh, come up during the show today, feel free to leave those in the comments down below. Maybe may be able to add them to today's show or return to them in a future week. So let's dive into what I've got for you today. Uh, for that, I'm going to switch you over to the Digistar view. And uh, just real quick, uh, mention something that you should see in the news in the near future. Uh, space agencies around the world have their eyes set on Mars this summer. Every couple of years, uh, Earth and Mars are, are well aligned in their orbits around the sun to have spacecraft go from our planet uh, to Mars. And three spacecraft currently planning to start that journey later on this month. Uh, first, we have the HOPE mission from the United Arab Emirates, their first uh, Mars mission. Uh, they've already had to delay the launch a couple of times because of weather at their launch site in Japan. Uh, so stay tuned for that, perhaps early next week. Uh, then uh, China's first Mars mission, Tianwen-1, uh, perhaps launching around July 23rd. Not a lot of public information about that launch date out there, but that's the best estimate I've seen. And then, of course, NASA's next mission to Mars, the Perseverance rover and its little uh, Ingenuity helicopter hitchhiker. Uh, that one is uh, currently targeting no earlier than July 30th. Uh, certainly, as the launch date for Perseverance uh, approaches, we'll have a lot more information for you. Uh, so stay tuned for uh, many, many launches to Mars and the ongoing saga of Mars exploration. A little bit closer to home and something that uh, you may be able to see for yourself. Uh, we've also got uh, some, uh, some breaking news that you may have already seen uh, in the headlines this morning if you read as much space news as I do. Uh, it involves uh, something that is kind of in the sky right now. Uh, it is our sun. Now, if you watched, I think it was three weeks ago, did a whole show about the closest stars, including our own sun. And I showed you some images from this spacecraft here. Uh, this is the Solar Dynamics Observatory. It's in orbit around the Earth right now. And its only job is to stare at the sun and take pictures every few minutes. Uh, here are some of the pictures that it takes. Uh, these are images taken in uh, an ultraviolet light. I'll be on the purple end of our rainbow. It shows the lower layer of the sun's atmosphere, its corona. Now, uh, SDO is not alone. It's not the only spacecraft we have uh, studying our sun. Let's see if we can pick out the locations of a couple of others. There's our Earth, SDO's pretty close to uh, to our planet. Uh, but there are a couple of other spacecraft that I believe have made cameo appearances in my uh, my previous shows. Uh, they get a little bit closer to the sun. I've got them off in the distance for you there. Uh, looks like I see the Parker Solar Probe on the screen now. And another one just appeared. I know they're kind of dark in color, tough to see. Uh, another uh, spacecraft called the Solar Orbiter. 
that has appeared on your screen way up in the top right corner. We'll fly over and take a look here. Now, Parker Solar Probe has been in orbit around the sun for a couple of years now, and its mission is uh, well underway, though it's going to continue to advance over the next few years and uh, make closer and closer approaches to the sun. Uh, solar Orbiter is relatively new in space. It launched back in February, and just this morning, uh, scientists working on the mission released the first images from the Solar Orbiter spacecraft. It has some instruments that are kind of similar to, uh, to uh, SDO, Solar Dynamics Observatory, the image you already see uh, up in the corner there, uh, but it has some unique instruments on it as well. Uh, so let's just start with uh, the, uh, the actual first view from uh, Solar Orbiter that was released. Uh, this one is in a similar wavelength of light as the Solar Dynamics Observatory image. So there's uh, SDO, the older spacecraft, on the left, uh, the brand new picture from Solar Orbiter on the right. So uh, we're seeing similar features in the Solar Corona here, but from a different angle because of, uh, uh, of Solar Orbiter's position in the solar system. This is also the closest picture uh, taken of the Sun, simply because Solar Orbiter's uh, current trajectory takes it about uh, half of an astronomical unit from the Sun, so about half the distance between the Earth and sun. So, uh, so, so Solar Orbiter is able to see some pretty unique things. Uh, I showed a, a, an image similar to this during the, uh, the show that featured the sun. This is just the sun's visible surface, its photosphere. And uh, if you get real close to your screen, you can see uh, kind of little, uh, little granular uh, type cells on the surface of the sun. And uh, that's just uh, the result of the convection that brings heat from the inside of the sun up to the surface. So we can certainly see that from the Earth Earth, but uh, getting a unique view from Solar Orbiter. Uh, solar Orbiter's instruments also allow it to measure the sun's magnetic field. So now the different colors on the screen, uh, some parts of uh, uh, the picture got a uh, much brighter yellow, some are, are deeper purple. Uh, those show regions of, of different magnetic polarity, like the Earth has a north and south magnetic pole. Uh, there are regions on the sun that have those same uh, magnetic polarities, but uh, it's all mixed up all over the surface of the sun. And, and, and one of Solar Orbiter's big missions is to figure out how that magnetic field forms in the first place. We think it might be something called a dynamo. It's the same way that the Earth's magnetic field forms, uh, but uh, you know we don't really know the full story for the sun just yet. Uh, this view shows you the, the full uh, uh, hemisphere of the sun, and again, color coding for the magnetic field. Uh, by the time Solar Orbiter uh, uh, reaches its final science orbit, it will be able to see the poles of the sun, which will be kind of unique. Uh, for now, it's uh, just studying uh, some other features that uh, we, we've already studied in, in previous missions and we've already seen it in previous uh, uh, episodes of this show. Uh, here is the solar corona, a higher uh, layer of, uh, of the corona, which we saw earlier, visible from Earth during solar eclipses. And uh, even farther from the Sun, uh, Solar Orbiter is also imaging uh, the uh, the effects of the, uh, uh, the Sun's light and the solar wind on uh, dust a little farther from the Sun. So uh, this image is showing a lot. It's four individual images. You've got the glow from uh, dust in the solar system off to the right. Planet Mercury actually makes a cameo appearance off to the left there. Uh, and uh, my favorite view is, uh, is actually this one here that kind of stitches all those pictures together. So you get a little tiny view of the sun, uh, its actual surface there at the center of the screen, then the uh, the lower corona there uh, in green, and then that wider view that I just showed you, uh, you know, all the way out to the orbit of Mercury. So uh, Solar Orbiter is helping give us a, a pretty a pretty complete view of the sun's immediate environment. Uh, and uh, these early images, although they're just kind of test images, calibration images, uh, they're going to get better, um, they may have already made an interesting discovery. If you take some of those images from uh, the lower corona, stitch them together, you can make a little video, and uh, mission scientists are already noticing little bright spots all over the place. You might be able to pick out some of yours on your screen. And they thought they looked kind of like campfires. So that's what they've been nicknamed, uh, campfires on the sun. Now, uh, they're much bigger than any campfire you uh, you may have had here on Earth. Uh, these are hundreds of kilometers, hundreds of miles wide, uh, the size of uh, some states or uh, some small countries. So uh, these, these are fairly large cities uh, in human terms, but, but small features on the sun. And the fact that they are all 
over the place may help solve a, a long-standing mystery in, uh, in solar science. It's why the gas in the corona uh, can get so much hotter than the surface of the sun itself. And all these little tiny flares, all these little campfires uh, just above the sun's surface may help heat that, uh, that gas, heat that plasma up. Uh, so, so more detail is going to be coming in as the mission continues, but uh, pretty interesting that already in these, these very first images uh, may already be solving some pretty big scientific question. So uh, keep an eye on that. Uh, all right, while uh, Solar Orbiter continues studying the sun, um, let's shift uh, topics just a little bit. And I see that uh, Ah, got, uh, got a little question. Uh, uh, Dace asks, uh, could you share info on where to best view Comet Neowise? Ah, it's like you read my mind. Yes, that is our next topic. After the sun sets tonight, the next thing that uh, you should probably target in the nighttime sky is this comet. Told you a little bit about it last week when it was only really visible in the early morning hours. But that is not my favorite time to be awake. So I'm happy to tell you now that it is visible in the early evening, just after the sun sets. Uh, here's the view looking to the northwest about one hour after sunset uh, tonight. It's about 930 here in Richmond. You may be able to pick out that little comet pretty low in the screen. If we move forward a little bit in time to about 1030 uh, p.m., uh, the comet is now lower, but the sky will be darker. Probably pretty tough to see right now when the sky is really dark, but uh, the comet is still approaching the, uh, the Earth. So we'll get a little bit higher in our skies as it continues along its orbit and, uh, and separates itself from the sun just a little bit. That's kind of a uh, double-edged sword, though. It's getting farther from the sun, so the comet may get dimmer. Uh, but... In the northwest, low in the horizon is the best place to look. If you aren't able to see it, uh, say, tonight or tomorrow night, uh, that's okay. I would say keep going out a little bit after the sun sets, 9.30, 10 o'clock, uh, maybe even 10.30 as we get into next week, and, uh, and take a look. I'm going to advance us in time here just a little bit. Uh, everything should be configured, so we take one step. Uh, one day uh, steps every couple of seconds. So that's tonight, that's tomorrow night, that's where the comet is the night after that, the night after that, so on and so forth. I'm going to go ahead and play it until uh, July 23rd. Uh, that will be next Thursday, and that will actually be when Neowise is closest to the Earth. Uh, so that uh, maybe when it is at its brightest for uh, us here on the Earth, uh, as its activity uh, diminishes, as it recedes from the sun, uh, and then as it also recedes from the Earth. So got another week or so to, to hopefully catch a good view of the comet in the north eastern skies. Uh, low, close to the horizon, just after sunset, uh, to help you find it. Uh, here is the comet's altitude in the sky, and this is again, I fast forwarded to next Thursday, uh, but that's measuring in degrees. So 10.30 p.m. Uh, next Thursday, it'll be, looks like about uh, 17 degrees or so in the sky. If you wanna know where to look, uh, just make a you know, little telephone with your hand, uh, but hold it out at arm's length, and that will uh, measure about uh, 20 to 25 degrees for you, depending on how long your fingers are and how long your arm is. But uh, that's a good rule of thumb to, uh, to help you locate it. So uh, there's Neowise in the sky. And uh, oh, while we're on the topic, uh, I do also need to, uh, to issue a correction. Okay, we all make mistakes. I know it actually has to do with last week's uh, potentially surprising fact of the day. I told you that the orbit of Neowise has a period of almost 7,000 years. And that is currently true. Uh, the orbit it's on now uh, will take it about 7,000 years to go all the way out to the outer solar system and come back into the inner solar system again. But as Neowise entered the inner solar system on this orbit, it felt the gravitational pull of the planets and actually shifted its orbit a little bit. So the last time that it made a trip around the sun, its period was probably a little bit shorter. Well, we certainly can't uh, pin it down to an exact number, but because the law of gravity is 
relatively simple as laws of physics go, uh, we can uh, kind of work backwards in time and sort out where its orbit may have been. Uh, that blue orbit is uh, where we see Comet Neowise moving through the solar system today. The last time it came into the inner solar system, it may have followed that red path instead. And that path didn't take it quite as far from the sun. Uh, so it's old orbital period may have been about 4,000 years. So, you know, there is a chance that if people saw it 4,000 years ago, they did make written records of it. Uh, we just haven't been able to match it up to uh, any uh, current observations of the comet. So, uh, so there you go, a minor nitpicky correction, but uh, I'm nothing if not nitpicky. So uh, there you go. Uh, now, let's, uh, before we leave the solar system, uh, take care of a couple of your questions from last week. I think I've got enough of them saved up that I can't even answer all of your questions this week, but I did want to, want to address a couple of them. Uh, while we're on the topic of comets, well, let's take a look at uh, this question from Aparna. Aparna asks, are comets similar to asteroids with different trajectories? And, uh, well, sort of, yes. I would say that's a good way to describe them. We see some pretty extreme orbits on the screen right now, belonging certainly to a comet. If you want to see a typical orbit for an asteroid, well, uh, let's zoom in, make sure we can see the uh, 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 main asteroid belt on our screens here. And uh, I'll just show you um, a couple of objects. So one of these is a comet, one is an asteroid. Uh, pick out the one you think is an asteroid. I wish you could just tap on the screen or something to let me know your answers, but uh, I will show you mine. Uh, let's see, so I've color coded the, uh, the pictures there uh, and uh, they match the orbits that you're seeing on the screen. So uh, the object on the right in the pictures is an asteroid. It's got a fairly circular orbit uh, between Mars and Jupiter. Uh, the one that uh, I've marked in blue is a comet. Now its trajectory isn't that different, but it's different enough that it comes uh, into the inner solar system, crosses the uh, the orbit of Mars uh, just barely, and, and at that time it warms up enough that uh, sunlight uh, can uh, vaporize the ices contained in the comet. It helps form those tails like we see for Neowise, if you see any pictures of, uh, of that today. And then it recedes a little farther from the sun. It freezes again. Now, uh, it's not so much the trajectory that these objects are in today that really makes the difference. The big difference is where the objects originally formed. And that's going to determine the mixture of material that are in these objects. Uh, just by looking at asteroids and comets to our eyes, they may not look all that different, especially when they're far from the sun. Uh, but if they originally formed farther from the sun, beyond a limit that uh, a planetary scientists would call the frost line, uh, they're going to have a lot more ice in them. Uh, for the solar system, we think that frost line, as, as these objects were forming, was kind of in the main asteroid belt, or at least where the asteroid belt is today. So objects that formed inside of the frost line can have more rocks, metals, and minerals uh, because uh, water at that distance from the sun would have been uh, more likely to exist as a liquid or as a gas, as water vapor. Beyond the frost line, uh, the water can be frozen. It becomes locked in these cometary objects and uh, only released when their orbits change and they venture closer to the sun. Uh, to show you what I mean in a little more detail, here are two more objects, uh, similar in size, uh, but orbits very different today. Uh, one of them is an asteroid in there in the main asteroid belt. Had to back away a bit so you may have a hard time seeing its orbit. Uh, the other one is way out beyond Neptune. Uh, you may recognize that picture if you watched uh, oh, three, four, five weeks ago, whenever we talked about the Kuiper belt and Pluto and things like that, uh, that more distant object that I'm showing you now is Arakoth, uh, a Kuiper belt object that's visited by the New Horizons spacecraft. It certainly formed beyond the frost line. I can put the frost line back on your screen, but it's going to be so close to the sun, you may have a hard time seeing it. Uh, so, so objects like Arakoth formed beyond the frost line. They're full of ice, uh, but unlike comets, which we now see dive into the inner solar system and get warmed by the sun. Uh, these objects stay in the outer solar system all this time, uh, and uh, they truly are kind of the leftovers of, uh, of the formation of the solar system. So, uh, so, so that's an interesting distinction as well. Uh, and I know I'm not giving maybe the, the, the most clear answer to your question, Aparna, but 
that's kind of the way astronomy goes sometimes. It can be difficult to, to answer these questions clearly, and objects can move from one category to another. Uh, can I definitely say that any given object is always a comet and always an asteroid? That answer is definitely no. Uh, orbits change, the compositions of objects can change as they lose their ice. Uh, so what is a comet today may not be a comet tomorrow or in a few millennia. Uh, let's see, looks like another question has come in before we leave the topic of, uh, of comets. Uh, Laura asks, how did Neowise get its name? Well, comets like Neowise are traditionally named after their discoverer. Uh, so you go all the way back to the, uh, the first comet that was recognized to make repeat visits to the inner solar system, uh, Halley's Comet. That's named after Edwin Halley, uh, who, uh, who uh, first uh, uh, realized that, uh, or excuse me, Edmund Halley, uh, who first realized that, uh, that it was the same object visiting the solar system every time. Uh, Neowise got its name because it was first detected uh, earlier this year by a spacecraft called Neowise. It's the Near Earth Object Wide Field Infrared uh, Survey Explorer. I may have to issue a correction on that next week, but I think I got it. Uh, so there are actually several uh, comet Neowises. Uh, so this one technically is C2020 F3 Neowise. Uh, so, but uh, we should call it Neowise because that's much easier. It's named after the spacecraft that discovered it. Uh, thanks for the question, Laura. Uh, all right. Uh, I think I'm pretty much done with asteroids and comets. So unless you've got more questions, let us know. Uh, but since I mentioned the New Horizons mission, I would also feel bad if I did this whole show uh, without mentioning the fact that... Uh, Tuesday was the fifth anniversary of New Horizons reaching its first flyby target, the dwarf planet Pluto. Yeah, anytime you see a cool looking picture of Pluto or its moons, it was probably taken five years ago. Uh, July 14th, 2015, New Horizons flies by Pluto. It gives us our first up close view of this strange little world at the edge of our solar system. Uh, whether you name it uh, or call it a planet or not, uh, New Horizons revealed that there were amazing and uh, surprising features here. Uh, planetary scientists now pretty convinced that Pluto, uh, despite being 4 billion miles from the sun and having a surface temperature in the neighborhood of minus 400 degrees Fahrenheit, still has an underground ocean. Its surface has uh, maybe the largest glacier in the entire solar system, this uh, light tan area I'm zooming in on here called Sputnik Planitia. It's got huge ice mountains, 1,600 foot ice uh, blades on its uh, hills, and uh, all kinds of other features that are too numerous for me to list and get into. Uh, but amazing mission of discovery to, uh, to see Pluto up close. It also gives me an excuse to answer another one of your questions. This one doesn't seem initially related, but uh, bear with me for just a second. John asks, is it theoretically possible for a star to orbit a planet? Could a planet be the center of a planetary system? Well, that's an interesting thing to ponder. And I guess uh, part of that kind of boils down to how we write uh, or how we give labels to things. But let's look, uh, take a look at the Pluto system here. Uh, Pluto is barely the center of its system of moons. So we've got Pluto itself there. And then we've got the largest moon, Charon, in orbit uh, around Pluto. Uh, but you can see that Pluto is kind of moving in space there as well. Uh, Charon is, is fairly large compared to Pluto. It's about half Pluto's diameter. But the real important thing here is the mass. And, and Charon is about 1 8th Pluto's mass. And because they're so close together, that means uh, the center of mass or the gravitational balance point between these two objects is, is actually an empty point in space. So in truth, Pluto and Charon orbit around each other uh, because their masses are relatively similar and they are pretty close together. Now, a few weeks ago, I also showed you an example of what the smallest possible star might look like and what the largest possible planet might look like. In size, they'd be pretty similar. But in mass, uh, because you have to be very massive to ignite nuclear fusion at your core, uh, uh, the, the star is going to be more massive by a factor of approximately six. And that's not so different from the Pluto-Charon uh, ratio of 
8. So if the largest possible planet and the smallest possible star were, uh, were close enough together, we might have a situation kind of like Pluto and Charon here, where they orbit an empty point in space, but that star will still be closer to the center. All right, pretty interesting thought experiment. Thanks for that, John. Man, uh, I've already had a great time, but uh, I had some other content planned for today, too. Uh, so let's, run, let's start the next phase of our journey. I promised you last week that uh, we would start exploring some things that we can't easily see with our eyes. Uh, Pluto and Sharon, you can take a picture of them in visible light. Uh, your eyes can see them. You can see the sun with visible light. You should never look directly at it, but uh, you can see it. Uh, but that's not true for everything that happens in the universe. In fact, we, we already saw the, uh, the sun's atmosphere, its corona, that really only visible in ultraviolet light at uh, the, uh, the, the, the close uh, uh, distances to the surface of the sun. So uh, let's, let's expand our view across what's called the electromagnetic spectrum. Here's a view of the nighttime sky from Earth again. I'm exaggerating a few things, especially if you live in a city like Richmond uh, around here, uh, because human eyes can't actually see so well at night. Uh, we've got street lights, uh, lights on our buildings, things like that. So uh, the whole sky over the city glows a little bit, and uh, you can only see a handful of stars. And get away from the city a little bit, and skies will be a bit darker. Uh, you might be able to see things like the Milky Way. We started talking about that last week and uh, it's it's visibility in the nighttime sky here again probably exaggerated a little bit I've, I've never seen it that bright in the nighttime sky uh, but this is the best time of year to try and catch a glimpse you just have to get away from city lights to do it but anytime you go outside and look up at the sky everything you see is coming into your eyes and being processed by your brain uh, allowing you to see it but in a limited range of colors Everything that humans can see is in a range of wavelengths in the visible part of the spectrum. Uh, you know all the colors, uh, so the rainbow, uh, red through purple, uh, that's just a tiny fraction of, of the colors of light uh, or the, uh, the energies of radiation that the universe has to work with. The full electromagnetic spectrum ranges from radio waves down through visible light and all the way out to gamma rays. Uh, so there's a, a wide variety of different kinds of objects and uh, phenomena that we're able to see if we study the universe around us in all these different wavelengths of light. I definitely won't be able to get through all of them today, but uh, well, let's focus on the ones we can actually see from the surface of the Earth that at least to start. Uh, one reason that uh, you maybe don't hear so much about the way the sky looks like in uh, some of these wavelengths of light is because Earth's atmosphere blocks a lot of these colors. Uh, we most likely evolved to see visible light uh, because there's a nice window in the atmosphere where a lot of visible light gets through and so you know visible sunlight gets to the earth illuminates things here so we're able to see that section and then a lot of radio waves can pass right through earth's atmosphere as well. Uh, that is why telescopes here on the Earth uh, tend to be built to uh, use either giant mirrors or to a lesser extent today large lenses to collect visible light or they look like the big radio dishes you'd like to have on your house to pick up satellite TV. Uh, those are radio telescopes because they can pick up radio waves to get through the atmosphere. Now astronomers get kind of creative sometimes. Some infrared light gets part of the way through the atmosphere. So if you can get above most of the atmosphere by say putting your telescope on an airplane, that works too. But uh, for observing here on the ground, mostly visible light and radio waves. So uh, what can we see in those colors of light? Well, uh, at the very end of last week's show, we got to the center of the galaxy. And I believe I mentioned that uh, some strange phenomena at the center of our galaxy was first hinted at by radio observations. These were taken almost 100 years ago, way back in the 1930s. And uh, this is a similar view of the radio sky. This is not data collected 100 years ago, but it uh, is a similar type of, uh, of radiation. And the brightest point on your screen right now is indeed the center of our 
galaxy. So uh, that is the region originally called Sagittarius A uh, or Sagittarius A star once they study a little bit more. And that's the home of that supermassive black hole as well as all those stars and strange gaseous objects and everything else we saw at the end of last week's show. Uh, so, uh, so there's the center of our galaxy, but we should be freed up here to kind of survey around. Uh, a lot of the other things that uh, we'll see here in this kind of radio light will be similar to uh, what is being highlighted at the center of our galaxy there. Uh, the environments around uh, massive objects like black holes and other super, uh, excuse me, other uh, supernova remnants. Uh, so those are some of the bright spots you're seeing there, uh, as well as uh, some big clouds of dust and gas. Uh, basically anywhere that uh, hydrogen gas is, is interacting uh, with, uh, with magnetic fields. That's, uh, that's what we're seeing here. Uh, my favorite kind of radio waves might be something called hydrogen alpha. It uh, is released when uh, electrons and hydrogen atoms make uh, make a transition. And, and I mentioned hydrogen alpha uh, last week as well. This is what was used to trace out the locations of uh, big clouds of dust and gas and help give us an idea of uh, the overall structure of our galaxy. These, uh, these big clouds are often associated with star formation and it helps trace the, uh, the spiral arms of our galaxy. I'm gonna do a little foreshadowing here. I'm trying to find my favorite patch of uh, big clouds of dust and gas. And it's this patch of sky right here. So try and remember that. We're gonna see it again in just a little bit. But I've shown you two very specific kinds of radio light. Uh, just like our eyes can see uh, a wide range of, uh, of visible colors, what if our eyes could see a wide range of radio colors? What if you could listen to all the stations on the radio at once? Uh, well, maybe our nighttime sky would look like this. Uh, so now we see a, a wide variety of objects. Those, uh, those big clouds of dust and gas, supernova remnants, young hot stars. Uh, the, the dots you might be able to see on your screen are not individual stars in our galaxy. Those are other galaxies where uh, the same kind of environment that we see at the center of the Milky Way uh, exists. Uh, although in most of those cases, uh, the, the black hole is uh, even more energetic, perhaps actively feeding on dust and gas in its environment and uh, sending extreme extremely strong radio waves out through the universe. Uh, so, so there is the radio sky. And if I had to pick one kind of light to actually be able to see with my eyes, aside from, uh, from visible light, radio waves might be it, just because of the, uh, the spectacular views that, uh, that might be possible uh, here in our own galaxy. But we can make some pretty interesting discoveries uh, if we, we focus in on some of these individual objects. Uh, what is one of the most interesting discoveries made in the radio part of the spectrum? Uh, well, for that, we are going to turn the clocks back to 1967. Uh, that is the year that uh, then a, a, a grad student named uh, Jocelyn Bell Burnell uh, discovered the first pulsar. Uh, these are uh, supernova remnants. They are neutron stars uh, that are rotating very quickly. They have strong magnetic fields that are not perfectly aligned with, uh, uh, with their uh, axis of rotation. So they send these beams of radio uh, uh, emission through the galaxy and uh, the first one was detected by uh, Jocelyn Bell in 67. Now Dame Jocelyn Bell Brunel, who by the way, turned 77 years old yesterday. So uh, so happy birthday, Dame Brunel. Uh, now here is the uh, the first pulsar discovered and uh, you're hearing a little bit of a, a simulated uh, sound from a pulsar uh, translated from those radio waves that, uh, that were detected. And uh, you can kind of see those beams of radiation uh, that are, are being sent across the galaxy from this rapidly spinning neutron star. Finding one uh, pulsar was interesting enough, uh, but Brunel helped discover the first four, and uh, in the decades since, astronomers have found thousands of them. So, uh, so let's put those up on the screen for you here. And uh, let's zoom out just a little bit. Now, because these, uh, these pulsars uh, all rotate at different speeds, and uh, in general, the rotation rates are incredibly consistent, uh, they serve as uh, 
well, sort of beacons in the galaxy. Uh, in fact, uh, there was an attempt made uh, with uh, things like the, uh, the plaques that were sent out on the Voyager and uh, Pioneer spacecraft to use pulsars, their distances from Earth, and the rate at which they rotated to uh, kind of help map our location in the galaxy for any curious civilizations that uh, might come across those spacecraft. Uh, maybe not the most efficient way to, uh, to map our location in the galaxy, but an effective way to do it uh, because of the, uh, uh, the power of these pulsars, their visibility across the galaxy, and their stability across time. So, so there you go, an interesting discovery in the radio part of the spectrum. Uh, if you remember the big map of the spectrum I just had up on the screen, uh, the next section would be microwaves, but I'm going to save that for kind of the, uh, I guess the grand finale, because uh, kind of the headlining discovery in the microwave part of the spectrum is the cosmic microwave background. Uh, but that's the most distant point we can get to in the visible universe, so we'll see that later. Uh, in uh, a tiny part of the spectrum uh, between uh, radios, uh, radio waves and infrared light, uh, something called uh, 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 submillimeter uh, waves. And uh, one interesting observatory that works there, so it kind of counts for microwave, uh, is called ALMA. It's an array of radio dishes in South America. It's pretty common for uh, especially radio observatories to use arrays of telescopes like this to effectively create one giant telescope. Uh, when I showed you the black hole picture last week, that was created with an array of radio telescopes that spanned the globe. Uh, so these big telescopes can, uh, can make interesting discoveries. And Alma has certainly made a long list of, uh, of fascinating discoveries. Uh, so let's see if we can track one of those down. Uh, the ones that fascinate me the most uh, with Alma are, are the ones that uh, show us the story of, uh, well, the formation of planets. Uh, I'm really fascinated with the objects in our solar system, uh, fascinated with what we're learning about how they formed and, uh, and evolved over time. Uh, and uh, since our solar system is, well, done forming, it's just evolving now, uh, if we want to answer some of the big questions, we need to see what's going on in other younger solar systems. So that's one of the things that ALMA allows us to do. It uh, can use its unique capabilities uh, to, uh, to observe solar systems that are still in the process of forming. Uh, and uh, that's what's done in, in a number of cases. I'm going to zoom in on one example. It is a star in the constellation Taurus named HL Tauri. Now the first thing we'll see as we zoom in here cameo appearance by our moon there. That's kind of neat. Uh, I got an image from the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, so that's going to be closer to uh, to a visible light view, a little closer to what our eyes might be able to see if uh, we were good at seeing faint objects. So uh, some big clouds of dust and gas here, uh, and I even see some jets coming out from, uh, from young stars in this region. Uh, but we're going to keep zooming in here, and uh, we're going to take a closer look at uh, this one particular star and the disk of dust and gas around it. As we get close, Alma reveals that this disk has a, a lot of structure to it. Uh, the bright bands are going to be denser parts of the disk. The dark bands are going to be maybe gaps in the disk. And uh, to me, this kind of reminds me to some other structures we've seen, uh, like the rings around Saturn. Now, the gaps and structure in Saturn's rings are because of all the moons in orbit around that planet. And the gravitational pull of the moons organizes the little particles in the rings, uh, gives it the uh, structure we see today. Uh, so perhaps this is the same thing is happening in this disk around HL Tauri. And indeed, simply because of the, uh, uh, the structure that Alma has been able to see in some of these disks, it's credited with discovering several planets, or, or perhaps we should call them protoplanets for now, because they're probably still in the process of growing and are not yet in their final form. Uh, so, so that's a pretty interesting discovery as, as we move out of radio and microwaves into the infrared part of the spectrum. Uh, but I think before I end today, I will sneak in uh, just, just one more one more object. Uh, we'll get on into the infrared part of the spectrum. Uh, and uh, let's look at a, uh, a famous object 
not too far from H.L. Torrey. Uh, it's in a pretty famous constellation. Uh, you may already recognize the collection of stars straight ahead. If you do recognize it, Ah, oh, man, again, I wish you could just yell it out in the dome so I could hear you, but just tell whoever's in the sitting closest to you what constellation that is. Uh, if, uh, if you don't know, uh, that constellation happens to be Orion. Uh, you may know it uh, by uh, the three straight, uh, three stars in a straight line forming its belt. Uh, a few other bright stars help trace out his arms and legs. But this is also the part of the sky that I focused on when I had those uh, those radio waves up there before. In H alpha, these big clouds of dust and gas become visible, and a lot of those big clouds of dust and gas are nurseries for brand new stars. The most famous nursery for brand new stars is probably the Orion Nebula. And I'm sure you've seen pictures of it. Yeah, it's uh, one of the most uh, photographed objects in the sky, I would wager. Uh, here's what a portion of the Orion Nebula would look like in visible light. Uh, this one comes from uh, the uh, European Southern Observatory's very large, or excuse me, this one's from the uh, La Silla uh, telescope. Uh, but I do have an infrared view for you from the very large telescope. And kind of the superpower of infrared light is that it is able to look through some of this dust and gas. And so we can see what's going on inside some of these nebulas. At the very heart of the uh, Orion Nebula, there's still a lot going on, so uh, maybe hard to see the details on your screen. But you're seeing a huge cluster of stars, uh, many of them formed from this uh, same dust and gas. The young hot stars in the center of the nebula, uh, 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 their, their winds are blowing out bubbles in the, uh, in the nebula. If we scan to a little bit different part of the nebula, we can actually see stars that were totally hidden from our view in visible light. Uh, so, so in thicker parts of the nebula, uh, we can see through it with infrared light and uh, reveal additional stars. Here's another bright star, pretty obviously carving out uh, this big bubble in the surrounding dust and gas. At the edges of these bubbles, uh, the, the dust and gas gets, uh, gets uh, clumped together. And uh, in these clumps, the next generation of stars can be born. Uh, perhaps my favorite part of the entire nebula is, uh, is down here. In our infrared view, a couple of things I would point out to you uh, at uh, well, maybe about the, the 10 o'clock position, uh, there's a star that's just kind of peeking out uh, around a really thick cloud of, of dust and not even infrared light can get through but it kind of uh, is illuminating the dust around it, which I think is pretty neat. And then uh, down at maybe the four o'clock position, uh, there's kind of a, a little uh, little cloud of gas that uh, sticks up uh, into the, uh, the view. And at the very end of a thin tendril of gas, there's a bright star there. That one perhaps brand new, just forming out of that little tendril of, uh, of dust and gas. Uh, watch what happens if I get rid of the infrared view, that star almost disappears. Uh, so, so that really shows you the power of infrared light. If I had a second choice for what kind of light my eyes would see, or maybe I could just add a power along with visible light. We can already see uh, infrared light might be a close second to, uh, to radio light because uh, here's uh, the whole view of the Orion Nebula if we could just see infrared light. Now, certainly because this light is usually invisible to us, uh, its its coloring here has been done, uh, uh, in a sense, uh, kind of arbitrarily. I mean, color has been picked out for specific reasons, but this is not necessarily what our eyes would see if we could see infrared light, but it does show you exactly the kind of structure and, uh, and detail that might be visible to us if we could detect those wavelengths of light. So there we go. Our next uh, stop along the electromagnetic spectrum would, uh, what I guess, be uh, visible light. And since that's what we can see every day, uh, I might as well return you to only seeing visible light. And uh, we'll hold off on those other wavelengths for next week's show. So, uh, so tune in again next Thursday, 2 p.m. Uh, we'll keep chasing down some uh, objects usually invisible to us. We'll explore the other end of the electromagnetic spectrum, high energy astronomy. Uh, and if you want to see some, uh, some black holes and things like that, uh, spoiler alert, that'd be a good show to watch. So until then, uh, thanks for tuning in. Uh, hope you have a wonderful weekend. Stay safe out there. Uh, it's been a joy to be your uh, guide here on 
to uh, this week's journey, and I hope to see you again next time.